waters are sometimes conceived as rivers or streams moving in the heaven and eventually falling into the mouth of Varuna, the nether ocean. This nether world was, so to say, the seat or the home of these waters, the eternal. They formed the kingdom of Varuna and Yama, as well as the hidden abode of Vitra. This movement of waters is very clearly expressed in Parsi scriptures. In the Venedad, the waters are described as follows. As the sea, Borokasha, is the gathering place of waters, rise up, go up the aerial way and go down to the earth. Go down to the earth and go up the aerial way. Rise up and roll along, thou and those rising and growing. Ahura Mazda made the aerial way. Up, rise up and roll along, thou swift horse sun, above Hara Berezadi, and produce light for the world. And mayest thou rise up there, if thou art to abide in Garo Naman, along the path made by Mazda, along the way made by the gods, the watery way they opened. Here the area waters are said to start from their gathering place, the sea of Orokasha, go up into heaven and come back down again to the sea to be purified before starting on a second round. Professor Dharmastutur, in a note on this passage, observes, Waters and light are believed to flow from the same spring and in the same bed. And he quotes Bundashish, which says, just as the light comes in through Alburs, Arab Barasati, the mountain by which the earth is surrounded, it goes out through Alburus. The water also comes out through Alburus and goes away through Alburus. Now, waters are described in Rig Veda as following the path of the gods, much in the same way as the waters of the Yavesta are said to follow the path made by Mazda, or the way made by the gods. Like the Avedic waters, the waters in the Rig Veda have also the sea as their goal, and going by aerial way eventually fall into the mouth of Varuna. But the Avesta supplies us with the key which establishes the connection of water and light in unambiguous terms, for, as remarked by Professor Dharmastister, it clearly states that both of them have the same source, and in the passage quoted of earlier, a swift horse sun is accordingly asked to go along the watery way in the skies above. In Abanyasht, the river Ardvi Sura Hanhita is described as running powerfully from the height Hukairya down to the sea of Vurukasha, like the river Sarsvati, which is described in Rigveda as tearing the peaks of the mountains, folk to descend from the great mountain in the sky to the sacrifice. Both are aerial rivers, but by coming down upon the earth, they're said to fill up all terrestrial streams. The terrestrial waters, nay, all things of a liquid nature on the earth, plant, sap, blood, etc., were thus supposed to be produced from the aerial waters above by the agencies of cloud and rain. Parsi scriptures further tell us that between the earth and the region of infinite light, there were three intermediate regions. The star region, which has the seeds of waters and plants, the moon region, and the sun region, the last being the highest. When Rigveda therefore speaks of the highest regions as being the seed of waters, not to be understood as supposed by Wallace, there is no nether waters, for it is the nether waters that come up from the lower world, and by moving in the uppermost region of the heavens, produce terrestrial waters by giving rise to rain and clouds. Thus, the river is said to run through a starry region and has to be worshipped with sacrifice in order that her waters may not all run up into the region of the sun, thereby producing drought on the surface of the earth. In Rig Veda, the Sarasvati is similarly described as filling the earthly region and the wide atmospheric space is besought to come swelling with streams and along the waters. But the most striking resemblance between these rivers is that while the latter is described as Vitra Slayer, the first is described in 
Abanyasht, it's granting to Thraytayona, the heir of the valiant Athway clan, who offered up a sacrifice to her, a boon that he would be able to overcome the three-mouthed, three-headed, six-eyed monster. This is virtually the same story which is found in Rig Veda where Trityapja, knowing his paternal weapons and urged by Indra, is said to have fought against and slew the three-headed son of Tavastri and released the cows. This clearly establishes the connection between waters, as represented by the rivers mentioned, and the slaughter of Vitra. Many Vedic scholars have tried to identify Sarasvati with the river of the name in the Punjab, but as the latter is now an insignificant stream, then the identification has not been generally accepted. Above comparison shows that the mighty Sarasvati, like the other river, is an aerial stream which rises up from the nether storehouse of waters, travels over the sky, and again falls back into the lower ocean. A portion of these waters is brought down upon the earth in the form of rain by the sacrifices offered to the river, and along it come the seeds of all the plants growing on the surface of the earth. Thus in the Venidad, the tree of all seeds, is described as growing in the middle of the sea of Orokasha, and the seeds are then said to be brought up by the aerial rivers and sent down by them to the earth by means of rain. An idea similar to that found in Rig Veda, where the sacrificer informs us that Soma has told him that all medicines are contained in the waters. We have thus a complete account of cosmic circulation of the aerial waters and the production of the terrestrial waters and plants therefrom. The netherworld or the lower celestial hemisphere is the home of these waters and it is expressly said to be bounded on all sides by a mountainous range. When the aerial waters are allowed to come up through this mountain, they travel over the lower hemisphere and again fall into the sea of Urukasha, or the lower ocean, producing during their course rains which fertilize the earth and make the plants grow upon its surface. But instead of sending down in the form of rain, these aerial waters were, it was apprehended, apt to turn away into the region of the sun and deprive us of rain. It was therefore necessary to worship them with sacrifices and invoke their blessings. It is impossible to grasp the real meaning of the Vitra legend without first realizing the true nature and importance of the movements of the aerial waters as conceived by the ancestors of the Indo-Iranian people. As observed by Dramaster, celestial waters and light were believed to flow from the same spring or source, and they both ran a parallel course. It was these aerial waters that made the heavenly bodies move in the sky, just as a boat or any other object is carried down by the current of the stream or river. If the waters therefore ceased to flow, the consequences were serious for the sun, the moon, the stars would all cease to rise and the world would be plunged into darkness. We can now fully understand the magnitude of mischief worked by Vitra by stopping the flow of these waters. In his hood and home, at the bottom of the Rajas, that is, in the lower hemisphere, he encompassed the waters in such a way as to stop their flow upwards through the mountain. And Indra's victory over Vitra meant that he released these waters from the clutches of Vitra and made them to flow up again. When the waters were thus released, they naturally brought with them the dawn, the sun, and the cows, either days or rays of the morning. The victory can thus naturally be described as a fourfold character. Now we can also understand the part played by the Parvatas, or mountains, in the legend. It is the mountain Alburus, and as Vitra, by stretching his body across, closed off all apertures in the mountain range through which the sun and the waters came up, Indra had to uncover open these passages by killing Vitra. Thus, Pundashish mentions 180 apertures in the east and 180 in the west through Albrus, and the sun is said to come and go through them every day, and that all the movements of the moon, constellation, and the planets are also said to be closely connected with these apertures. The same idea is also expressed in latter Sanskrit literature when the sun is said to rise above the mountain in the east or set below the mountain in the west. The mountain on which Indra is said to have found Shambhara, 
and the rock of Vala, wherein the cows were said to have been imprisoned by the demon, and which was burst open by Angiras, also represent the same mountainous range, which separated the upper from the lower celestial hemisphere, or the bright from the dark ocean. This explanation of the Vitro legend may sound strange to many scholars, but it should be borne in mind that the correlation between the flow of water and the rising of the dawn and the sun here described is not speculative. If the Vedic works do not express it in unambiguous terms, the deficiency is fully made up by Parsi scriptures. Thus, in Korshadyast, we're told that when the sun rises up, the earth becomes clean, the running waters become clean. Should the sun not rise up, then the devas would destroy all the things that are in the seven Karshvaras. The passage in the Farvardhan Yash is even more explicit. This Yast is devoted to the praise of the Fravashis, which corresponds to the Pitris of the Rig Veda. These ancient fathers are often described, even in Rig Veda, as taking part along with the gods in the production of cosmical phenomena. Thus the Pitris are said to have adorned the sky with stars, and placed darkness in the night and light in the day, or to have found the hidden light and generated the dawn. The Fravashis in the Parsi scriptures are said to have achieved the same or similar exploits. They are described as having shown the beautiful path to the waters, which had stood before a long time in the same place without flowing. And the waters are then said to have commenced to flow along the path made by Mazda, along the way made by the gods the watery way appointed to them. Immediately after, the Fravashis are said to have similarly showed paths to the stars, the moon, the sun, and the endless lights that had stood before for a long time in the same place without moving forwards through the oppression of the devas and the assault of the devas. Here we have the correlation between the flowing of the waters and the moving forward of the sun distinctly enunciated. It was the Fravashis who caused to move onwards the waters and the sun, both of which had stood still for a long time in the same place. Professor Darmastester adds a note saying that it was in winter that this cessation of motion occurred. The Fravashis are further described as destroying the malice of the fiend Angramanyu, the Vestic representative of Vitra so that the waters did not stop flowing, nor did the plants stop growing. In Yashna, the Fravishis, who had borne the waters upstream from the nearest ones, are invoked to come to the worshiper, and a little further on the waters are asked to rest still within their places while the Hota shall offer, evidently meaning that it is the sacrifice offered by the invoking priest that eventually secures the release or flow of the waters. There are other references to the flowing of waters in Parsi scriptures, but those cited above are sufficient to prove our point. The main difficulty in the rational explanation of Vitra legend was to connect the flow of water with the rising of the dawn, and the passages from the Farvad and Yasht, quoted above, furnish us with a clue by which this connection be satisfactorily established. There are two passages in the Venidad which give us the period during which these aerial waters cease to flow, and it's necessary to quote them here, inasmuch as they throw further light on the circulation of the aerial waters. It has been stated above that, according to Professor Darmister, these waters cease to flow during the winter. But the point has been made perfectly clear in Fargat 5 and 8 of the Venidad, where Ahura Mazda declares how the corpse of a person dying in winter is to be dealt with, until it is finally disposed of according to the usual rites at the end of the season. Thus, Ahura Mazda is asked, If the summer is past and the winter has come, what shall the worshipper of Mazda do? To which Ahura Mazda answers, In every house, in every borough, they shall rise three katas for the dead, large enough not to strike the skull, or the feet or the hands of the man, 
and they shall let the lifeless body lie there for two nights, three nights, or a month long until the birds begin to fly, the plants to grow, the floods to flow, and the wind to dry up the waters from off the earth. And as soon as the birds begin to fly, and the plants to grow, and the floods to flow, and the wind to dry up the waters from off the earth, then the worshiper of Mazda shall lay down the dead with his eyes towards the sun. We've referred to this passage previously, but as the theory of the circulation of aerial waters was not then explained, the discussion of the passage had to be postponed. We now can clearly see what is meant by phrases like floods to flow and plants to grow. It's the same phrases which are used in the Farvarden Yasht and are there connected with the shoving forwards of the sun and the moon which had stood still or without moving in the same place for a long time. In other words, the waters as well as the sun had ceased to move during winter and the worshipper of Mazda is ordered not to dispose of the corpse until floods begin to flow and the sun to move, be it for two nights, three nights, or a month long. The Mazda worshippers believe the corpse was cleansed by its exposure to the sun dead bodies could not, therefore, be disposed of during night. The passages from the Venidad above referred to, therefore, clearly indicate that the season of winter was once marked by long darkness, extending over two nights, three nights, or a month, and it was during this period that floods ceased to flow and plants to grow. It was during such a winter that the difficulty of disposing a corpse arose, or Mazda is asked that the faithful should do in such cases. The question has no meaning otherwise, for if in the ancient home of the Mazda Yashinians, the sun shone every day during winter, as it does with us in the tropical regions, it would have been no difficulty in the disposal of a corpse by exposing it to the sun the next morning. It would be absurd to ask the faithful to keep a clearly unclean dead body in his house for two nights, three nights, or a month long until the winter passed away. The passage from Thagad 5, quoted above, makes no mention of darkness, though it can easily be inferred from the statement that the body is at last to be taken out and laid down on the Dachma with its eyes toward the sun, evidently meaning that this ceremony was impossible to be performed during the time the dead body was kept up in the house. But the same subject is again taken up and mentions darkness distinctly. Thus, Ahura Mazda was asked, If in the house of the worshipper of Mazda, a dog or a man who happens to die, and it is raining or snowing or blowing, or the darkness is coming on when the flocks and the men lose their way, what shall the worshipper of Mazda do? To this, Ahura Mazda gives the same reply as Fargat 5. The faithful is directed to dig a grave in the house, and there let the lifeless body lie for two nights, three nights or a months long, until the birds begin to fly, the plants to grow, the floods to flow, and the wind to dry up the waters from off the earth. Here, in the question asked to Hur Mazda, darkness is distinctly mentioned along with snowing and blowing, and in Farvat Yasht we've seen that the flowing of waters and the moving of the sun are described as taking place at the same time. The passage from Tiryasht where the appointed time for the appearance of Tishtria after conquering Apuasha in the watery regions is described as one night, two nights, fifty or a hundred nights. It's already referred to in previous videos. From all these passages taken together, it inevitably follows that it was during winter when the water ceased to flow, the sun to move, and the period of stagnation lasted from one night to a hundred nights. It was a period of long darkness when the sun was not seen above the horizon, and if a man died in that period, his corpse had to be kept in the house until the waters again commenced to flow, and the sun appeared on the horizon along with them. It was pointed out previously how the Hindu belief it is inauspicious to die in the Dakshinasyana must be traced to this primeval practice of keeping a dead body undisposed of during the long Arctic night. The word katya, which is used for grave in the Parsi scriptures, occurs once in the Rigveda, where the sage Kutsha, lying in Katya, is described as invoking the vitra slaying Indra for his protection. And appears here we have at least an indirect reference to the practice of keeping dead bodies in a Katya until 
Victor was killed in the waters of the sun made free to run their usual course. We're however, here, only concerned with circulation of celestial waters and from the Vedic passages quoted above, it is clear the aerial waters cease to flow during winter for several days, or rather nights, and that, since light sprang up from the same source as water, the sun also ceased to move during the period it stood still in the watery regions, until the Favrashis, who helped the gods in their struggle for waters, or in their conflict with the powers of darkness, made the waters and the sun move onwards to take their usual course in the upper celestial hemisphere. We now understand why Indra is described as moving by his might the stream upwards, and how rivers are said to be set free to move on by killing Vitra, or how Indra is said to have made the lights of heaven shine forth without obstruction and set the waters free to flow. There are many other passages in Rig Veda where the flowing of waters and the appearance of the sun or dawn are spoken of as taking place simultaneously, as may have been seen from quotations of MacDonald's Vedic mythology given above. All these passages become intelligible only when interpreted in the theory of cosmic circulation of aerial waters through the upper and lower celestial hemispheres. But as the theory was little understood or studied in this connection, the Vedic scholars, ancient and modern, have hitherto failed to interpret the Vitra legend in a rational, intelligible way, especially the four simultaneous effects of the conquest of Indra over Vitra. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing to our videos. If you know anyone interested in this kind of content, please let them know. It sure helps us out a lot.